There is a mystery. A mystery that most of you encounter every day. You seek it out, sometimes obsessively. You travel great distances and spend much of your hard-earned cash for it. You might even envy those who appear to have mastered this mystery. Yet even those who have mastered it often drift into madness while searching for more answers. This is the mystery of music. Scientists and philosophers have theorized for ages about how and why music affects our minds and souls, but modern man is no closer to understanding it than his ancient ancestors. It remains a mystery as elusive as consciousness itself. Some believe that music, like many of the great mysteries of the universe, is best treated as a wild creature. Observe its beauty from a distance, get too close, and it will eat you whole. A bright blue 88 Ford van follows a lonely winding road. Outside of the road is a dense, tall forest typical of the American Northwest. Yellow duct tape on the sides of the van spells the name Altamira. The highway is so empty and boring that even a GPS could fall asleep and get lost, which is just as well because the GPS in this particular van displays in bold lettering, no network. In the captain's seat sits Yuja. She drums her fingers at 11 and 1 on the steering wheel. She rubs her eyes and fights a yawn. Jesus, can't they just mow these trees down? I can barely see the turns. Douglas firs tower over the side of the road like sleepy guards. The sky is a flat gray. In the shotgun seat sits Keith. He plucks gingerly on his banjo, humming in a register only a man of his small size could reach. On his lap sits a notebook with scribbled phrases like, Love is absurd. Love is life. Forever is holding my arms. Doobie doo wop. Then a half page of angry black scratches and cover ups. He jots down the words lost in our valley, moving with melody. We saw, we saw. He pauses, then hums, pleased with himself. In the back lounge two others, Chelsea and Joey. Joey reclines on a bass drum case and scrolls through pictures from a concert on his phone. It's selfie after selfie of Joey setting up a guitar amp, Joey with a drunk concert goer. Joey eating a vegan burger. Joey himself drunk and giving a thumbs up while vomiting in a parking lot. Joey from the stage facing an empty concert venue trying to maintain his stage smile. The photo roll is punctuated by a very blurry smear of what appears to be a large group of people in daylight. Strange. He doesn't remember taking that photo. Must have been left over from a festival. He deletes it in size, unsatisfied with his gallery. Chelsea leans on a bass guitar case, likewise scrolling through her phone. The van jolts suddenly. A heavy wreath of cords and cables drops onto Chelsea's head. Ow! What the hell was that, Yuja? Bum. Damn, girl, slow down! Shit isn't secure back here. That was the first bump in the past two hours. I think you'll survive. Yuja eases up on the gas as the turns on the road become even sharper. Chelsea swats the cables off her and mocks Yuja's tone quietly. Joey doesn't look up from his phone. You know, maybe if someone would pack her gear properly after a set instead of immediately hitting the bar, her shit would be more secure. Chelsea sneers at Joey. Oh, well who was it who said engaging with the fans right after the show is the best opportunity for merch conversion? Exactly. Engage with the fans, not the bartenders or local drunks. Our fans are the local drunks, Joey. Joey is about to respond when Keith strums loudly in frustration. Can you two stop bickering for one stretch of highway? It's making it very difficult for me to compose. You say everything makes it difficult for you to compose. This pen is crap. I need coffee. Why can't I get any good weed? Blah, blah, blah. Chelsea checks some chords into Joey's lap. You just wish you could write songs instead of hashtags. My hashtags have been better hits. Whoa. What? what? I just got some serious deja vu. Yuja pretends to shake it off and taps furiously on the useless driving app screen. Anyways, I said it before and I'll say it again. What we need is a proper manager. Someone who can help us sell tickets for once so I don't have to eat cliff bars and wash myself with the many soaps I steal from hotels. You know, I had a feeling this topic would come up again. So, I took the liberty of organizing a little social media campaign for us. What? Yep. Right now, we are heading towards the Sisipa Vortex. 
He makes whooshing sounds and moves his hands. No one says anything. Ah, come on, you guys. We talked about this. The new music video. We decided we could get some kick-ass clips there. No, only you wanted to do that. We never had an official band meeting about this. Actually, I wanted to do it too. Keith swings around to face the two in the back. Will you two cut it out with the internet fairy tale crap? It's a fun little gimmick for Altamira, but I'm starting to think it's really going to your heads. Keithy, Keith, Keith, you haven't scoured the sources like me and Joey. There's a refutable evidence that many of these vortexes are real. Vortices. Shit, here we go. What about that one story about the girl that went missing in the cave in Duluth and then showed up three days later 140 miles away in the woods, huh? Explain that one. My point is, you both take every paranormal thing you come across in life too seriously. Don't you think some things are just little allegories to help our little lizard brains interpret our, you know, environment? Keith, I hear your doubts, man. But the Sisip of Vortex, it's totally real. And if you think it's not, it'd still be killer footage and hashtag bait for our next music video. Who knows? Maybe you'll get inspired, too. Keith drops back into his seat. Forget it. I'm too tired for this. We're almost out of wherever we are anyway, right? Hey, don't I get to say? I'm the one driving here. How far is it, Joey? Funny you should ask. It's right there. Joey lunges and points. A sign clears the foliage from a turn. Welcome to the Sisipa Vortex, where reality becomes... The van comes to a screeching halt. Yuja turns with fiery eyes on Joey. You messed with my phone? Chelsea raises her hand. Actually, I messed with it, babe. You messed with my phone? Joey and I decided it would be more moral if a girl messed with another girl's phone. In case of a JJ selfies? That's why we're in the middle of nowhere land? Just where the hell have I been driving the past hour, then? Sound checks at five. You guys didn't let me finish my pitch. Look, this tour, it's a joke. We're all just at different phases in the grieving process. Except me. I'm a man of action and I have a plan. We're going to the Sisip of Vortex. We're going to take photos and videos and share it on all our stupid social media. Then we target a specific niche market, like the fans on the forums where Chelsea and I already have a little following on there, don't we, Che? Si, senor. After that, Keithy writes more of his tunes about wizards in love with fairies. We make a new music video using the incredible imagery we're about to get right inside that little special place. Joey points again to the Sisip of Vortex. Oh yeah? Then what? What we all dream of. Adoring and rabid fans with a sprinkling of fortune. You guys, this is the way the world is now. Touring in a stinky van that we borrowed from Keith's pervy uncle is inefficient and out of touch. It's time we get with reality by taking a step out of it. Joey presents, yet again, the Vortex. You just stares with contained rage. Keith just closes his eyes and shakes his head. And besides, he reveals a few pages of a printout. I already bought his tickets. A few moments later, the four bandmates look up at a sign of twisted metal that looks as if some country went to war with the Jetsons. Let's just get this over with. You just stomps past Joey and heads towards a small shack with yet another metal sign. Begin your journey here. We do not accept American Express. Keith wants to call out to Yuja, but doesn't know what to say. Instead, he turns to the other two. It's going to your heads. Keith follows after Yuja. Joey snaps another shot as Keith passes. For the fans, Keith. Remember? Let it go, Joey. Some people just don't want to admit the truth is out there. Maybe. Or maybe some people need their destinies created for them. Joey snaps another selfie as Chelsea follows the other two bandmates. He stands for a moment and inhales the clean, crisp air. He cocks his head. Was that thunder? He had checked the weather earlier. No sign of inclement weather. Oh wait, that was for when they were headed for the venue, not the Vortex. Even he had tricked himself into his own plan. Well played, Joey. Joey opens the door to the shack marked Enter Here and immediately bumps into Chelsea. His bandmates stand near the door, looking inward. A half dozen other basement chat room dwellers appear to have tolerated the outdoors for this special site as well. There's a lady, about 45, with long scraggly hair. A younger couple wearing mostly black, the result of a lot of fast food and potato chips. A afternoon tour? Everyone jumps at the voice. From behind a red velvet curtain, a small man with jet black hair and heavy coat emerges. 
He inhales deeply, then pulls the cigarette from his lips. A plume of thick smoke fills the heavy silence. His eyes are small and piercing. You just smacks Joey on the chest. Uh, right, yeah, uh, that's us. Joey breaks through the group and hands his printout to the man. He snatches the papers from Joey's hands and grumbles. Ashes from the cigarette flutter. His eyes slowly roll up to Joey. They look like black fangs beneath his gray brows. Against the brightly colored sweaters and branded postcards, he looks like Dracula. Gomez! Joey flinches as he yells. Bits of spit and bread go flying through the air. Some of it lands on Keith. A young boy, about ten, small frame, ruddy hair, and freckles, emerges from behind the same curtain as the man. The boy approaches, and the man mumbles something unintelligible. He points to Joey. The boy whips out his smartphone. You need this? Joey holds up the printout to the boy's phone camera. The boy takes a long, curious look at the bandmates, then nods to the man and disappears behind the curtain again. The man grumbles. <sighs> Damn e-tickers. All right, all right, everyone, let's get going. Name's Albert. I will be your tour guide. Albert heads for the door opposite of the curtain wall. Instinctively, everyone follows. Joy begins snapping pictures. One sweater in particular catches his eye, but Yuja pushes him forward. As the group walks through a makeshift gift shop, Keith grabs the same Sisypa Vortex sweater and aggressively wipes his face with it. Dude, what are you doing? Keith throws up a hand as if to say, not now, Chelsea. As Keith trudges on, the entire tour stops at the deck outside the shack. The patio overlooks a dense green forest with several other shacks that look like lazily built tree houses minus the tree. Albert pauses, wets his finger, and holds it to the air. He looks at some barometer along a pillar of the deck. There are murmurs. Shh! I must have complete and absolute silence. There's another heavy pause. Albert's expression drops a little. The current is particularly strong today. It must have something to do with recent solar flares. Chelsea and Joey giggle at each other like sneaky school children. Keith tisks. Yuju remains quietly pissed, arms folded and lips pursed. Unfortunately, this means we'll have to avoid the caverns, where the forces can be felt the strongest. All but Yuja and Keith groan and slap their brochures on their legs. Whoa, whoa, whoa! I... We pay good money and traveled a long way to see this. You can't just hold out the best attraction on us. The other tourists call out in support. The guide raises his hands. Now hold it right there. We'll still see the dual gravity shack, the stretch room, and... The vortex toilet. We better see the vortex toilet, says a man in the back who's clad in all black as he takes notes on an iPad. Albert shakes his finger at the man. You'll have to put that away, sir. There is to be no digital technology in sight. And yes, you'll get to see the famous Sisypa Vortex Toilet. Now let's get moving before the forces... He gestures to the sky. Force me to cancel more sights. Albert leads the way down the patio and towards the buildings and the foliage. The man in black slips his tablet into a side bag, also black, and trades it for an old-fashioned pen and paper notepad. He follows along with the others. Joey stands paralyzed as he realizes his endeavor may end up fruitless. Damn. I really wanted to see the caverns. He looks at his printed tickets now as if they were his college rejection letters, of which he had many. A heavy dose of deja vu paralyzes him. He freezes in place and visually takes in his surroundings. Sisipa. Sisipa. Dude, Joey. Joey continues to look around as if he appears lost in a place with which he should be familiar. Keith smacks him on the arm and Joey snaps out of his momentary lapse. Dude, Joey, let's ditch this joke of a place. We've got a show to play and you've delayed us enough. If we leave now, I promise to forget this all ever happened. Joey mulls this offer over as he watches the others disappear into the first shack. He hears Albert announce something loudly and hears a toilet flush, then applause. He looks at his bandmates. Keith's eyes are serious, yet pleading. Chelsea seems equally disappointed, and Yuja just looks pissed as always. What's more, there's a very distant voice from another universe in his mind, unintelligible yet understood. Keith's words feel like surrogates for something hidden and profound. Well, I guess... Uh... I can show you the caverns. They hear a voice from behind them, and they all turn around. It's the young boy. 
Comus, who scanned their tickets at the entrance. It's not that far, and way cooler than anything you'll see there. He nods at the shacks. The others were already moving on to the stretch room. At this rate, they'd be done in ten minutes anyway. Really? Joey's eyes grow wide, immediately forgetting the band's existential crisis. Which way is it? Joey? Comus extends his palm. Twenty bucks. I'll take you to where it is. Twenty bucks? That's double the single price admission. Twenty bucks for all of you. It's a good deal, believe me. The deal was that we get to see all of the Vortex with these tickets in the first place. Joey shakes the tickets in front of the kid's face. Well, then you can come back another time when you grow a pair of balls. I'm always here. The boy starts to turn away. God damn it, fine. Joey pulls out a wad of cash from his pockets, mostly torn, wilted singles. You're not seriously- That better not be from merch sales, Joey. We're not doing this. Joey turns abruptly to Keith. Screw you, Keith. I'm tired of you bossing me around as if you're the linchpin to everything we do. I paid into this tour just as much as the rest of us did and didn't complain a bit when you wanted to peruse all those lame-ass vinyl shops. Kick me out if you want. I don't care. He pauses. And your lyrics suck. Keith's face grows red, but Joey's words stick. Joey shoves the wad of cash into the kid's hands. Come on, Chelsea! Joey begins to walk in the direction of the shacks. Chelsea looks at Keith and shrugs. I mean, he just paid, so... Might as well, right? Yo! Comus calls to Joey. He nods the opposite direction, through the gift shop. Trust me, you won't regret it. Follow me. Joey, Chelsea, Keith, and Yuja follow the boy as he marches up a dirt path through even denser foliage than what grew out the back patio. The sky is much darker and heavier now. Yuja touches her cheek, then checks the sky for rain. The caverns are the best part, but to be honest, they're not safe for tourists. So my uncle always says he can't take people because of, quote, the solar conditions. He really just puts the caverns in the ads to get people to come to the dopey shacks. So is it true then? There is some kind of powerful force around this area? The kid shrugs. You'll see. Hey, you mind if I get some pics? The kid shrugs again. Chelsea looks at her phone. Psh, still no network. I'm totally gonna have to binge tweet when we get into town. Keith trails several paces behind the others. Every 30 seconds he stops, looks back down the path, curses something, then resumes the forward trail. Yuja catches Keith amidst a deliberation and rolls her eyes. She stomps over to him. Hey, stop the pity party. I told you Joey would be a pain in the ass before we started this tour, but you didn't want to do anything about it. I know, but I didn't expect we'd be looking for freaking Travis Walker. It's Travis Walton. Now, change that mood from sad to apathetic. Let's look at some stupid holes, then get the hell out of here. This place reeks of murdered tourists. Yuja turns away. Keith grabs her hand. He looks to make sure the others are almost out of sight, then leans into Yuja. She pushes him back. You really want to start a shitstorm right now? He leans in again. She lets him kiss her for half a second, then pushes him away. They exchange eye contact. Something goes unmentioned, inexplicable, yet acknowledged. A few minutes later, the group meets at a large wall of stone and moss. The color of the rock is a dark, dirty red. Deep creases undulate like the skin on the forehead of an old giant. It's beautiful, yet jarring. Joey holds up his phone and starts to record a video. Hey, what's up everyone? It's Joey, and I'm here at the criminally underpromoted Sisipa Vortex, about to get my mind blown by the caverns. Oh, shit! Joey slips, but quickly regains his footing. <sighs> uh, for those of you who haven't heard of Sisipa Vortex, it was discovered by Native Americans some centuries ago as evidenced by the paintings within the walls. I'll snag some pics of those if I can. But here's what's really creepy. For centuries after the Vortex was first discovered, None of the tribes would go near it. When the white man first came looking for precious metals, the Indians warned the foreigners to stay away. The caverns, they said, would eat men alive. Of course, the white guys laughed and figured they meant a, a bear or a pack of squirrels or something. But after a handful of surveyors and miners disappeared, 
Word got out and everyone stayed away from the caves. The Indian legend continued by saying that people didn't just die in the caves. They disappeared completely. Ooh! CTA, Joey! Chelsea yells from behind. Joey stops recording and swings around. What? CTA, call to action. Remember, every moment of our social media needs one. Oh, right. I'll get it again once we're closer. Hey, aren't those the caverns there? Over the ruddy hillside, all gaze at a dozen large openings about 20 feet away. Yeah, but let's keep going. I'm going to show you the best one. They round a large section of the stone hill and stand before a lone, unassuming cave. Joey snaps a photo. This one's not as big as the others. Just go inside. Trust me. Despite his haughty skepticism, Joey hesitates from apprehension. He takes one step, then another. It could just be the wind from outside playing tricks, but it feels as if a warm breeze is coming from inside the cave. He enters, followed by Chelsea, then the boy. Yuja shakes her head at Keith. Dead tourists. Once inside the cave, the gray sunlight diminishes quickly. A blanket of darkness and earth muffles the moans of the world outside. Comus turns on a flashlight. Just a little bit farther. Follow me, but do not stray. Comus is almost out of sight, but his echoing voice reveals the hidden scale of the cavern. This is so cool. For a good minute, they step carefully on the damp stone floor, their footsteps quietly reverberating into the darkness. They walk far enough that the light from the opening barely outlines the curve of the path. Comus suddenly stops and raises his hand. Don't go any further than this line! He shines his light on a strip of yellow tape that stretches from wall to wall. Joey squints and shines his phone's light to see beyond, but sees only blackness. Why not? What's... Shh! Just listen for a sec. All hold their breath. Yuja holds on to Keith's arm, clenching the fabric of his jacket. Guys, this is stupid, let's... To her surprise, Keith quietly shushes her. She looks at him to scorn, but chokes on her words. He is still, focused. You guys hear that? The spelunkers hold their breath. A silent breeze teases their clothes and hair. Yeah, I hear that. She cocks her head further forward, but doesn't dare move her feet. Hey, isn't that... Joey stops. Not sure if he wants to say aloud what he really hears. Guys, can we please go? Keith begins to move forward. Yuja holds him back. He firmly removes her hands from his arm. Yeah, that's the song I was just writing back in the van. All clearly hear the faint tones now. It's an angelic echo of Keith's little tune from earlier. As if Keith himself were slowly, blissfully playing somewhere from deep within the cave. They can even make out a few of the words. The voice continues as Keith begins to move forward. Except it's... Whoa, whoa! Stop right there! Keith does not respond. He steps over the tape. Hey! I'm telling you to stop, jerk face! Except what, Keith? Keith doesn't respond. Instead, he turns on his phone light and heads into the void. Hey, damn it! I told you to stop! You can't go in there, it's dangerous! Too late, kid. Joey also steps over the tape and follows Keith's light. Chelsea mutters something unintelligible and tiptoes after Joey. Shit! Comus curses to himself and immediately runs back to the entrance. Yuja lets out alone, ha, huh, of bewilderment. Hey! Yuja calls after him, but the boy does not respond. Yuja deliberates for an infinite second before following her bandmates. Their three phone lights look like overfed fireflies. She didn't hear anything before, but as soon as she steps over the tape, the sounds become apparent. Hearing Keith's voice, or whatever that sound is, sends frost up her legs. She shivers. At the same time, she feels less afraid, more curious, even excited. After another few minutes worth of less than careful spelunking, the quartet stops. Keith stands in the center of a large, perfectly proportioned dome. He shines his light on the wall. 
Holy serious. Yuja now holds on to Chelsea, but neither notices. What they do notice are the massive, elaborate images on the walls and ceiling of the dome. They are primitive, stick figure representations, yet detailed and striking. Dude, guys, this is it. These are the ancient paintings from the Lost Tribes. The ones, shh. All become silent. The distant voice grows louder. Keith looks at the others for confirmation. What the hell is that? I think that's me. Except better. Yuja watches Keith's eyes grow glossy and wide, almost maniacal. Yeah, there's something about it. You guys, the kid was pretty mad. Let's turn around before... As Yuja speaks, she feels her curiosity muffling her fear. She and Chelsea step into the chamber, then break. Joey is now inches away from the drawings. This imagery is incredible. We should totally use it for our next release campaign. That's freaking genius! It would go viral for sure! I mean, look at it! It's probably never been photographed. Both Chelsea and Joey begin to grin. Their eyes grow wide and they cease blinking. Keith begins to chuckle. Forget just the marketing, we need to write our music here. I'm feeling a dozen songs bursting in my head right now. It's, it's so clear, so beautiful. This must be the feeling people get when they do like magic spells inside the Great Pyramids or some shit. The three begin to embrace the energy and splay their arms as if being showered with warm golden sunlight after a long winter. Yuja is the only holdout. Let's make a deal to come back here again. We need this place. And I think it needs us. It's a weird statement, but no one laughs. They all nod. I'm in. Let's come back. I agree. We should come here as often as possible. The playful snark has left Joey's voice. He is clear, articulate. Chelsea turns to Yuja. What do you say, Yuja? Yuja's mouth quivers through her slight smile, seems to be fighting, yet ultimately giving in to something. Chelsea extends her hand. Keith extends his. Yuja takes both and joins them in feeling the energy. A smile is about to cross her lips when... Stop! The voice explodes in the dome, binding the spell. The walls shiver. All turn to the source. A bright blue light emits from the entrance. It's Albert, the Vortex tour guide. He wears a construction hat with a guide light, earplugs, and a vest. A thick rope extends from the back of the vest back to the entrance of the cave. You kids need to get out of there right now! Albert's light shines on their faces. They look like the dead after rising from tombs. Their skin pale, their wide, glossy eyes, their steady grins. He hisses under his breath. It's probably too late now, but... You don't understand this place, what it does to people. Hell, no one does. Except maybe God or Satan or whomever you want to blame it on. That's why it's always been abandoned. Whatever it's doing to you, just know that it's not real. It tells you things, things you want to hear, then takes you from this world. I've seen it happen before. Just come with me while you still can, okay? I'll, I'll give you a 50% refund and whatever money Comus took from you. A flare of anger sparks in Keith's eyes. What do you mean it's not real, old man? I hear it. We all hear it. What you're hearing are tricks of your mind. Right now, the forces of this vortex are getting into your thoughts. It's those thoughts that make people think they're seeing something besides what's actually there. Back at the shacks, its effects are minimal. But in here? Albert begins to get a little more frustrated as he searches for the words or analogy to articulate the seriousness of the situation. It's like the opposite of your conscience, or, or the call of the siren from that Greek myth. You cross the line into its domain, and now it knows all of your wants and desires from the moment you were born to the day you die. Bit by bit, Joey moves away from the tour guide and closer to the source. I know it feels like it'll give you everything you want, but it's not real. Keith digs in his pocket and produces a pen. He furiously begins to scribble lyrics on his arm. He begins writing so feverishly, the tip of the pen begins to draw a bit of blood, but Keith seems unaffected. Do what you want, but I'm staying. The old man sounds like a hater. 
The mates look at each other, each confused by their emotions. Keith, in a flash of doubt, stops writing and shuts his eyes tight. He covers his ears, yet the music still plays, like a festival deep in the chamber of his mind. It's painful, but only because he realizes something. He releases his ears and allows his lids to soften. It's not just music, it's... Joey looks back at the images on the wall, then at Chelsea. The two wish the other had the answer. Even after years of devouring any information they could about touches with the supernatural, neither is prepared to face it. Neither notices the other's eye color slowly draining to black crystals. Kids, I'm telling you, it's now or never. Albert extends his arm, but is already pushing himself back from the wall with his other hand. Yuja looks at Albert, then her mates. Her mouth begins to quiver. Outside the cave, the sun has cleared through the gray clouds. Rich, blue sky begins to break free. The cave entrance is still. Not even a breeze rustles the grass. Then, some scratching. A figure emerges from the darkness. Yuja. She's dragging her feet as if she just woke from a week-long nap. She drops onto a patch of grass and rubs her eyes. More scratching. Keith emerges. Then Chelsea. Both join Yuja but say nothing. After a moment of catching the fresh air, they look back at the entrance. The last figure emerges. Joey. He takes a few steps to the others, then pauses. Well, how about that, guys? He doesn't say it with his usual brand of sarcasm, and no one laughs. Yet Joey's usual personality is reassuring. He shuffles over to them and completes their huddle. All sit there for a moment, silent, reflective. Keith is about to say something, when all hear a... They turn. Nothing. How was that? There. She points. They see someone duck behind some foliage. Joey stands, though he's not quite sure why. Uh, hello? A long-haired, bearded man leans from behind a tree. He has a camera with a lens the size of a cannon. The shutter bursts rapidly before he dodges behind the tree again. I can totally see you, man. Excuse me? All turn to the timid voice behind them. A tween girl with a big smile and thick braces clutches her phone to her chest. Could I get a selfie? The haggard, emotionally drained group looks at her with incredulous shock. There is a pause. Chelsea looks at the group, expecting pointed fingers and laughter for falling for a prank, but they return the confused stare. Chelsea looks back at the girl. Um, sure? The tween fan creeps in towards Chelsea as she taps the screen of her phone to open the camera app. I'm a huge fan, and I just loved your last song. I had my best friend choose her boyfriend over me, and I listened to it on repeat for weeks to help get over it. The girl sits next to Chelsea under the two pose. One by one, the girl snaps a picture with the bandmates, each posing awkwardly, mechanically. She reaches Keith. Which song was it you said you liked again? And how did it... Her phone snaps. She giggles as she reviews the images. What? Oh, the one that goes like this? She begins to sing. She has an angelic, soft voice. After only a few notes, the chill runs up the spine of each band member like the cold fingers of a giant ghost's hand. All recognize the tune. It's the same as the one they heard in the cave. The same as what Keith plucked out of his banjo back in the van. Keith shrinks from the girl, then jerks his head over his shoulder. Another voice sings from the trees. A strange man, late twenties, emerges from the other side of the forest. He wears dark framed glasses, a cleanly parted haircut, and a t-shirt with cool stylized font with the word Altamira on the front. Whoa, I didn't see that in the merch box. More voices harmonize. A motley crew of strangers emerge from the trees. Well. Not all strangers. They see the black-clad couple as well as the others from the tour. They reach a roaring cacophony and then... Silence. Keith, still in a backwards crawl from when the girl who first started singing, doesn't notice the tears streaking from his eyes. 
Yuja's expression is a medley of horror and awe. Joey, still standing, somehow looks dumber than ever before. Chelsea freezes for a moment, then manages to break her gaze. She looks around at the silent, smiling choir. Her hands autonomously jerk together. Clap. Then another. Then another. The singers look at one another and begin to clap and cheer as well. They begin to chant. The other mates break from their icy poses and look around. They see a variety of Altamira shirts, posters, and cardboard signs with phrases like, We love you, Joey. Guys, I think I know what's happening. Keith cracks a nervous smile and comes to his feet. Without looking, he grabs Yuja's hand. She gently reaches for his arm, but keeps her gaze on the fans as they begin to slowly approach. Keith. They love us. Yuja looks at the faces. Wide smiles, sincere eyes. She manages her own smile and pulls him closer. Yeah. The crowd begins to close in on the group. Chelsea begins to laugh. Hands reach out to her clothes and hair. Phones and cameras block their view. You guys, come on! The mates turn to Keith. We got a show to catch! Keith pulls Yuja past the crowd. Chelsea, through her laughter, sees Joey still standing dumbfounded as hands fondle his face. Chelsea yanks him by the wrist and the two dive through the audience. For a good minute, the mates push through the thick yet yielding bodies, which is a bit odd for a crowd of this size. After they break from the crowd, they run. Keith looks back. Behind Chelsea and Joey, the crowd begins to run after them, cheering tirelessly. Each step pushes a laugh or a yelp from the mates. Before long, their cheering is indistinguishable from the stampede behind them. They clear the foliage and see the van. With the terrain wide open, they break into a full sprint, leaving the fans a safe distance behind. Yuja remembers the keys, but doesn't stop until she and Keith slam into the passenger door. She fumbles to get it open. She opens it, gets in, then helps Keith. She moves to the side door and opens it just in time for Chelsea and Joey to jump in without breaking stride. She takes one last look at the fans, who are now screaming in frenzied delight. Arms splayed to the sky, mouths wide open. Joey rips his phone from his pocket and points the camera at the oncoming mob. As the shutter clicks, Yuja pushes him out of the way and slams the door shut. The interior of the van goes dark, save for the light of Joey's phone. The screen displays a very blurry smear of arms and faces in a grassy field. Yuja drops into the driver's seat and starts the engine. It might be a creeper's van, but it's a trusty van. She shifts it into drive and punches the gas, slapping the mud and grass out from under them. Within seconds, they are back on the road. Joey opens the side door and he and Chelsea look out. Keith leans out the passenger window. Their fans are still in pursuit and show no signs of slowing. Each member notices their heavy breathing. They trade a glance, then close the side door. That was intense! Shit, I know, right? They were treating us like, like, we were the Beatles. Forget the Beatles, Oasis! Joey looks at Chelsea and grins. She returns the smirk. Keith rubs his face and starts to catch his breath. I didn't believe him for a second. Who? The old man. He tried to talk us out of it, but I just knew this was for us. Joey hoists himself up and punches Keith's shoulder. What did I tell you, man? I knew it'd be worth the stop. Best 20 bucks the band has ever spent. Yuja looks around. It still seems like, well, Earth. So, like, are we in some kind of, like, I don't know alternate universe now? Everyone suddenly goes quiet. Joey looks out the back window but sees the same old highway. Chelsea feels her face, hair, and, with some apprehension, breasts. From what the tour guide was saying and what we just experienced, that cave must have opened up a new reality or something where- Where we're like sick rock gods. Goodbye piss on opening act. Hello stadium stars. Joey lets out a root and pumps his fist. Altamira! Altamira! Joey echoes the chant of the fans back at the vortex. Keith, Yuja, and Chelsea join him in increasing enthusiasm. Watch out! The road takes an unexpected hairpin turn. Yuja slams on the brakes and yanks the wheel. The van feels like it's about to tip over, then crashes back down. Some of the gear topples. All freeze. The van still seems to be on the road. They seem to be still alive. They let out a communal sigh. Yuja cautiously steps on the gas again. Okay, let's try not to end our careers here of all places. Sorry, I, I just gotta... Anyway. 
Joey repositions the bass drum and plops himself down. Chelsea leans against the bass amp. Keith cools his nerves by pulling out his banjo. He begins to think back. What was that tune again? He rubs his face and tries to regain his concentration. Joey thumbs through his phone. Huh, that's weird. Chelsea flips through her phone as well. What, still no reception? No, well yes, that too, but I, I swore I took a picture of the sign. Chelsea shrugs without looking up. Joey lets it go. The bright blue 88 Ford van winds swiftly up the forest highway. Yuja's phone reads, no network. She drums her fingers at 11 and 1 on the steering wheel. She rubs her eyes and fights a yawn. Joey sees a picture on his phone. It looks like a very blurry smear of what appears to be a large group of people in daylight. Strange. He doesn't remember taking that photo. Must have been left over from a festival. He deletes it and sighs. Jesus, can't they just mow these trees down? I can't even see the turns. Keith plucks gingerly on his banjo, humming a pathetic tune. On his lap sits a notebook with scribbled phrases. Love is absurd. Love is life. Forever is my holding arms. Do be do wop. Then a half page of angry black scratches and cover-ups. He jots down the words, lost in our valley, moving with melody. We saw, we saw. Pauses, then hums, pleased with himself. The van jolts and his pen digs a long line into the page. Ow, what the hell was that, Yuja? Bump. Damn, girl, slow down. Shit is insecure back here. That was the first bump in the past two hours. I think you'll survive. Yuja eases up on the gas anyway. The turns become even sharper. Chelsea swats the cables off her and mocks Yuja's tone quietly. Joey doesn't look up from his phone. Maybe if somebody would pack her gear right after a set instead of immediately hitting the bar. Yuja tightens her grip on the wheel. She looks at the endless trees as the bickering in the back continues. She hears Keith yell something at Joey and Chelsea. Suddenly, an image of a dark place pops in her mind. There's a bright light and someone saying something. Perhaps it was a dream from the night before. At any rate, something about this place gives her the creeps. She takes a deep breath and shakes herself out of it. My hashtags have been better hits. Whoa. What? I just got some serious deja vu. There is a pause. A chill passes through the van like an invisible fog. Then Chelsea huffs. I've said it before and I'll say it again. 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 Back at the Sisipa Vortex entrance, Albert and Comus stand coldly as a pair of tourists wave goodbye. All that's left in the parking lot is Altamira's crappy tour van. After everyone is out of sight, Albert turns to Comus and glares. Comus sticks his hands in his pockets. I was just trying to save up for a new Xbox controller. Albert begins to walk to the van, but stops. Get rid of those annoying e-tickets. But they're so much more convenient to- Albert maintains his glare until Comus nods. And if anyone asks, those brain-dead dreamers were never here. Understand? Uncle Albert? What happens to them? Albert chews his lip and pinches the ends of his sleeves. Comus senses fear from his uncle's eyes. I said, understand? Yes, sir. Now. The best we can hope for is that they show up somewhere, sometime. Like Aunt Monique? Albert looks at Comus. Then, after a moment, he takes off his jacket and walks to the van. Distant thunder rumbles. And so it seems we are no closer to understanding the power of music any more than our fellow bandmates. How unsatisfying. I personally was hoping they would find someone like Frank Zappa as the source within the cave, or maybe the members of Yes who could have shed, or shredded, some light on the matter, or maybe a really grumpy Beethoven who could hear and speak English. But the search continues. I wish you luck, dear listener, 
in your journey to understand for yourself the ethos of music. Till next time, from the Hidden Pages. Hidden Pages was created by Sammy Sarzoza and Aaron Gould, who hold the copyright. This episode is titled Eternal Chorus and was written and produced by Sammy Sarzoza and Aaron Gould. The narrator was performed by Eric Pierce. Joey was performed by Scott Baxter. Chelsea and Comus were performed by Kate Huffman. Keith was performed by Jeff Harlow. Yuja was performed by Mary Taylor. Albert was performed by Andy Gates. The dialogue was mixed by Joel North of East Coast Radio Creative, and the artwork was created by Scribble Studios. To listen to more and learn about upcoming episodes, visit thehiddenpages.net.